Hi, everybody. For those of you who didn't meet me yesterday, my name is Braden Yellman. Um, I am internal medicine and rheumatology board certified, and I have been with the Bateman Horn Center now for about um, 17 months or so. Uh, we specialize in uh, chronic fatigue and chronic pain, and so I've been doing that exclusively now for the last 17 months. Um, and this is part two of our uh, series. So I wanted to go into unraveling the complexities of chronic pain and fatigue part two. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So I wanted to focus today on comorbidities uh, that we see in chronic pain and fatigue. And a lot of these will come up as actual diagnoses, but I think by the end, some of the objectives I want to share is that um, while we may make multiple diagnoses and find multiple things when we look for them in patients, there's a lot of overlap there. And there's a lot of uh, really complex interactions between all of these different systems. So when we look at a patient with chronic pain, obviously the patient themselves are thinking they never know what to expect next. They're always frustrated. They have no energy, migraines, fatigue, guilt, brain fog. And then we on the practitioner side are trying to constantly think about what could be causing these things. And sometimes it's not as simple as a, uh, a if A, then B solution. So I'm going to start with a, a patient case. And this is a patient case that's going to run through the course of the entire presentation. And um, my, uh, my confession is that this is an amalgamation of several patients that I have seen. Uh, I have seen patients present with the overlaps that are shown today, but there's a bit of an educational slant to this as well. Um, so our patient today is a 31-year-old female who comes in with a chief complaint of seizures and increasing diffuse muscular pain, not just during the seizure episode, but all the time. So she had been noting nausea and anorexia earlier in the day. She took a nap, but after she got up from the nap, she went to take a shower. She noted nausea, a rapid heart rate. Her face was flushed. She was feeling really anxious while showering and said, you know, I got to stop. So she ended her shower early. Um, got out of the shower, and while she was standing in front of the mirror, she started to dry her hair and began to experience tremors, uh, both in her neck and in her bilateral upper extremities. She noted that she was disoriented, um, and uh, she became kind of unresponsive for a few minutes. Her husband witnessed this. Um, she then experienced an episode of syncope and may have bumped the side of her head on the edge of the bathroom counter during this episode. She had no true loss of consciousness, uh, the duration of her tremors prior to the syncope was for about 30 seconds total. Uh, and as far as after the event, her husband thought she seemed confused, had some word finding difficulties and disorientation for about 30 minutes or so. She did not report any preceding visual changes or aura-like symptoms. She had no loss of continence, no tongue biting. She had not started any new medications or supplements and was not a drug, tobacco, or alcohol user. So over the past two years, she had experienced uh, maybe 10 similar episodes of tremors, very mild tremoring episodes, but did not experience syncope. Uh, when she would experience these symptoms, she'd laid down, and that would usually help her resolve the symptoms. Uh, she did note a recent non-febrile upper respiratory illness. She had some runny nose, sinus pain, possibly some cervical lymphadenopathy, and a little bit of, of cough. Uh, this was in the presence of a known sick contact from her daughter and her daughter's friends at school. She also noted a stressful home situation uh, due to increasing medical bills, actually, because she has been spending the last year, year and a half, uh, going to a lot of different medical specialists. And then of note, her grandmother had recently passed away, which was a pretty traumatic event for her. Her past medical history uh, seems pretty extensive, but not unlike many of the patients that come into our clinic, depression, chronic pain, anxiety disorder. She's had lots of migraines, reported panic attacks, uh, presumed ADHD, rashes that have been termed eczema, uh, Raynaud's changes in her hands and feet, irritable bowel syndrome, exercise-induced asthma, seasonal allergic rhinitis, dysmenorrhea, and interstitial cystitis. So a lot of things that we see in our patients with fatigue and chronic pain. No alcohol or drugs, no tobacco, uh, her social history was positive for not participating in any athletic activities except for gymnastics uh, up into grade school. She had an associate's degree and had worked in a chiropractic office for a few years, but had sort of retired from that to be a homemaker. She has two children and one dog, uh, one Lisfranc fracture, status post RIF in her left foot, a history of cholecystectomy like every single person in Utah. And then her family history was positive for a mother with chronic fatigue syndrome, a sister with anxiety disorder, 
and a father with prostate cancer. Her medication list was uh, once again extensive, not unlike what we're used to seeing, uh, but mostly uh, using lorazepam for PRN panic attacks, hyoscyamine for her IBS symptoms. Um, she was on lots of vitamins, probiotics, um, other medical supplements, took Wellbutrin for her anxiety and depression, used albuterol for her uh, exercise-induced asthma, although she didn't exercise much these days, and then risotriptan, um, PRN for migraines. And uh, her allergy list was, was quite extensive to, um, you know, ranging from SSRI she had been on in the past and other anxiety treatments to a pyramid had been given in the past to try to prevent migraines, uh, ciprofloxacin as an antibody, uh, or sorry, an antibiotic, uh, mediated allergy. And then you can see lots of other things from her normal environment, latex, bananas, adhesive from band-aids, Play-Doh from her kids, watermelon, mites, jello, paint, Febreze. All these things seem to give her symptoms that she described as an allergy. She went to a cardiologist and her vitals were noted to be uh, a febrile heart rate of 107, blood pressure of 102 over 68, 14 respirations, and she was satting 97% on room air. They, uh, there was a normal heart and lung physical exam. She had had some lab workup that was all unremarkable. Uh, had a 48-hour Holter monitor uh, done in an effort to look for causes of syncope. And this was essentially negative for any arrhythmia, except just note of some sinus tachycardia. She had a normal transthoracic echocardiogram. And uh, her syncope episode was not thought to be cardiogenic. She had also seen a neurologist in the course of this workup. Uh, and was told her tremors were not consistent with traditional tonic-clonic movements. Uh, she had a normal neurology exam in the clinic. She had an MRI of the brain that was unremarkable for any masses. There was no demyelinating disease, no mesial temporal sclerosis. And she had an EEG study without any epileptiform activity. She was told there was no indication to pursue video monitoring. Uh, she had no limitations with driving. She was not started on any anti-epileptics. And she was asked to consider seeking care from behavioral health. So now this patient is in your office asking for help and you're thinking, well, she's already seen two specialists. What next? What are, what are we going to call this? What are we going to do next? And I know a lot of us are thinking the same thing. Is this a non-epileptiform seizure or a pseudo seizure? So we might be inclined to say something like, you know, you're perfectly health, healthy. Um, you know, we see this sometimes. You're, you're going to be okay. You just need to work on your anxiety and depression, you need to work on diet and exercise and everything will be just okay. So she's now in our office for help and using some of the tools that we got from Dr. Bateman yesterday, we actually decided to go ahead and do a 10 minute Nasaline test on this patient. Her supine heart rate was 88 and her supine blood pressure was 100 over 64. And during the test, we actually had to suspend it early because she almost experienced syncope during the test at seven minutes. Her heart rate jumped up from that 88 to 118 within the first minute, and it peaked at 132 at that seven minutes before she crumbled to the ground. Um, and in fact, there was a, a peak standing heart rate at five minutes all the way up to 140. And you'll notice that her blood pressure also uh, became more narrow in the pulse pressure in particular, it narrowed by 18 millimeters of mercury. And you can see it went from 100 over 64 to 96 over 78. Um, the observers who were performing the Nasaline test noted cyanosis in the bilateral feet. And they also noted a mild rhythmic, almost beating tremor in the neck and in the right upper extremity this time. And she actually said that was very similar to some of the seizure episodes she had had in the past. So uh, I wanted to bring that up uh, mostly because we have on many occasions seen patients who, uh, have, who meet criteria for POTS, as you can see in this case, um, who have been labeled as having uh, a non-epileptiform pseudo-seizure and told that they actually have a behavioral health issue. And certainly one can appreciate from these vital signs that there's something very wrong with the autonomic nervous system. So I would argue this was not a pseudo-seizure and this is actually representative of some of the orthostatic intolerance that Dr. Bateman had touched on yesterday. So moving forward with our patient, she has a lot of problems as, as you recall from her initial uh, presentation. So she's now complaining of increasing bilateral foot pain and redness in the feet. And you can see a picture there of her feet. Uh, this was a macular presentation. It had no texture to it. It would blanch to the touch. And it was also a little warm to the touch. The margins were gradual. They weren't well demarcated. 
Um, it was painful, but she didn't find it to be itchy. She had no associated fevers, leukocytosis. She'd had a repeat ANA done. That was done in the cardiology office as well. It was one to 80, uh, which I will remind people is actually a negative titer since I'm a rheumatologist and this is my soapbox. Um, there was no improvement with a course of antibiotics. And her question was, could this be autoimmune? And in the effort to see if it was autoimmune, a skin biopsy was actually performed. Uh, it showed no neutrophilic or lymphocytic infiltration and no interface dermatitis, which is what we're often looking for in autoimmune uh, disorders. There were no positive immunofluorescent stains, no infectious organisms identified, but there was no of decreased innervation of the skin by the small fiber nerves. And so this is really a presentation of what we would call erythromyalgia, and it's in the setting of a small fiber polyneuropathy. So small fiber polyneuropathy is present in about 40% of patients with fibromyalgia who have skin biopsies, uh, random skin biopsies. It's not merely associated with pain syndromes, but is often a cause of or result of underlying systemic diseases. And it's estimated that 90% of cases of small fiber polyneuropathy are undiagnosed and definitely not treated. Um, and there's, there's all kinds of estimates at this point, but some have estimated a worldwide prevalence of up to 400 to 500 million people suffering from a small fiber uh, polyneuropathy. So the small fiber nerves are small, unmyelinated sensory afferent C fibers and thinly myelinated alpha A delta fibers. Uh, they also include postganglionic sympathetic autonomic axons. We don't always think about the autonomic portion of this, just the sensory portion. So these nerves are very small in diameter, uh, and they actually innervate not just the skin, but most organs and tissues. So here we have uh, a, a collection of skin samples with immunofluorescent labeling of the small fiber nerves. Um, and you can see that they are involved in sensation, they are involved in vasomotor actions, uh, and pilomotor actions within the skin, and also the sweat reflexes. Small fiber polyneuropathy cannot be diagnosed by traditional nerve conduction studies. Uh, informal neurological exams are generally not sensitive for the detection of small fiber polyneuropathy. I can't tell you the number of times that a neurologist has said, I don't see anything abnormal on the neurology exam. Uh, and sure enough, they do test positive for small fiber polyneuropathy. That test by gold standard now is a punch biopsy. Um, generally, they recommended the lower leg. Uh, where you're looking for the small fibers in the skin as a surrogate for small fibers in the other organs as well. So that's the best gold standard test we have right now. I'm not going to get into the utility of when to test and when not to test for the purposes of today's visit. That can be argued and is maybe a discussion for another day. Um, but I do want to point out that, it, like we said, it's not just in the skin. There's loss of innervation of myovascular structures in small fiber neuropathies. And perhaps you can appreciate on these slides you have normal on the top and small fiber polyneuropathy on the bottom. That is a, a blood vessel, and you can see the absence of innervation on the small fiber polyneuropathy patient. And so this loss of myovascular innervation can actually result in a patency of blood vessels that leads to a tissue arteriovenous, sh arteriovenous shunting of blood. In other words, you go straight from the arterial side to the venous side and just completely bypass the capillary beds. Um, and in fact, here on the right, this is a study of arteri arteriovenous shunting um, just in the skin alone uh, in a biopsy study of control patients of fibromyalgia patients. And you can see the uh, immense increase in arteriovenous shunting that was present in patients with, with fibromyalgia. And that wasn't even with a confirmed diagnosis of small fiber polyneuropathy. Autonomic functions of the small fiber nerves include heart rate response to deep breathing, heart rate and blood pressure response to a Valsalva maneuver, uh, the heart rate and blood pressure response to tilt, which is indeed what we were, what we kind of look at when we do a Nasoline test, the sweat response, and even gastrointestinal functions. And I put here signs of a panic attack just to kind of point out that it's interesting that people think uh, that panic attacks have a lot of the exact same symptoms. And so when we assume people are having panic attacks, we do need to think about the autonomic nervous system as well. So the gut is particularly and densely innervated by small uh, fiber nerves, and the loss of these fibers can actually lead to all kinds of abdominal and digestive symptoms. People notice uh, esophageal and gastric dysmotility, uh, colonic dysmotility, nausea and vomiting, particularly after eating, uh, dyspepsia, weight loss, anorexia is not uncommon, 
Um, and in fact, some young women with these type of disorders will actually be diagnosed with anorexia nervosa, uh, diarrhea, constipation, and even symptoms of irritable, irritable bowel syndrome. And then lastly, I think it's important to point out that um, most peripheral nervous system structures are shielded from the environment and protected by the blood nerve and blood brain barrier, but small fibers are actually designed to be exposed to the environment so that they can relay information about that environment to the rest of the nervous system, the protected part of the nervous system. So C fiber uh, nerve ends um, within the skin actually respond to external threats through detection of cytokines, interleukins, and other immune and inflammatory signals uh, with an afferent upstream signal. And neurons in the sensory ganglia, like the dorsal root ganglia, are imbued with fenestrated capillaries that help with the detection of infection or inflammation. So these uh, small fiber nerves are an immense part of the immune system and the immune signaling as well, and it's easy to lose track of that. So moving on with our patient, um, she's also coming to us saying, you know what, not only do I have these red painful feet, do I have these uh, pseudo seizures, but I'm having all kinds of headaches. They've been going on forever. Can you help me with those? So she has this long-standing history of migraine headaches, and it started really uh, about the time uh, that she experienced menarche. Uh, she used to experience about six per month, which is more than enough, but uh, her frequency has now increased to three to four per week over the last five, 1.5 years, um, which is becoming a little more debilitating for her and, and really life-changing. She's not really sure if there's an aura, but she does kind of notice some fuzzy vision um, prior to her headaches. There's associated photophobia, significant sound sensitivity. Um, it is disabling. Uh, she's been unable to drive and take care of her family or children or prepare food when she's experiencing one of these headaches. And she usually just deals with them by going to bed and waiting for the next day, waiting for them to go away. So she would sometimes get relief from rizotriptan, but other times when she'd take it, she didn't really have any response. It was rather underwhelming. No benefit uh, with Excedrin migraine. Uh, she was unable to tolerate amitriptyline as a preventative therapy due to dizziness. She had no history of traumatic brain injury, no history of concussion or other head injuries. Again, her MRI from before was unremarkable. Her neurology exam from before was unremarkable. Uh, she had tried to pyramid, as we alluded to in the past, but this led to difficulty breathing as well as cognitive slowing. And she could not afford a trial of Botox therapy, not unlike many of us. So talking about migraine specifically, this affects up to 15 to 20% of the adult population. Uh, migraine is actually included in the World Health Organization list of the top 20 conditions leading to years lived with disability. Uh, and I wanted to focus on specifically the impact of the calcitonin gene related peptide in the pathogenesis of migraine today. So we've noted that blood and saliva levels of CGRP are elevated during migraine attacks within people who have migraines. We've also noted that injection of this molecule can induce delayed onset migraine in people who have migraines, but not in healthy controls. And triptans, interestingly enough, which we use all the time, have been shown to normalize CGRP levels. So what exactly is CGRP? It's a 37 amino acid neuropeptide that is most abundantly expressed in sensory neurons and uh, primarily functions as a primary afferent neurotransmitter. Highest concentrations have been found within the outer lamina of the spinal cord, dorsal horns, and within the trigeminal nucleus caudalis in the brain. Um, we'll have an image of that in a second. Also found in the peripheral uh, nerve fibers that innervate the heart, the coronary arteries, the vascular beds, and the myenteric system. CGRP receptors are sometimes found in different places and generally in what we call second order neurons. So those that receive the primary afferent input, um, and there's very little expression of the receptor upon the cells that release CGRP. Uh, they are highly concentrated, these receptors, on neurons within the spinal cord and cerebral gray matter, and they're highly expressed in the meningeal vasculature, which is innervated by primary afferent fibers from the trigeminal ganglion um, that releases CGRP in the first place. They're also found in high quantities on a lot of the cells that we didn't think did much in the neuro uh, neurological system in the past, the satellite, glial cells, and astrocytes as well. Uh, it turns out they do a lot more than we thought they did. So I want to touch on CGRP's role in the trigeminovascular system, which is really thought to be the, the most up-to-date understanding of migraines. So this is a neurological system that processes incoming nociceptive signals. The peripheral inputs originate from meningeal blood vessels, uh, as you can see out here. 
um, and then they move their way to the trigeminal ganglion, which you can see kind of hidden here. Is ever I think my arrow is hopefully visible to everybody there. Um, and they also get inputs from the dorsal root ganglions uh, in the spinal cord, and these move up into the trigeminal ganglion and the trigeminal nucleus caudalis as well, which you can see here. Um, so all of this system inputs to the trigeminal nuclear complex, which includes this uh, trigeminal nuclear caudalis, uh, nucleus caudalis, and also some extensions in the C1 and C2 level, which I'm going to refer back to that later. Keep that in mind. So we have stimulation of these sensory nerve pathways um, utilizing CGRP, which transmits nociceptive inputs through the dorsal root ganglion um, in the periphery as well. And neurogenic signaling from these primary afferent fibers signaling peripheral inflammation uh, out in the extremities or elsewhere, other noxious stimuli are then transmitted to second order neurons within the spinal dorsal horns and transmitted up the trigeminal nucleus uh, up to the trigeminal nucleus caudalis. So I guess in this, this picture here, you can kind of see again, this is in the brain, whereas this is out into the spinal cord. So we're talking about pain pathways um, outside of the central nervous system as well, entering the central nervous system. So these signals then propagate into supraspinal sites within the brain. Um, and actually after they hit that um, trigeminal nucleus caudalis here in the brainstem, they then move upwards to uh, supraspinal sites, including the parabrachial complex, the amygdala, and the intralaminar thalamic complexes. So when the trigeminal ganglion receives nociceptive input in the periphery, such as ischemia, such as an infection, like a cellulitis, for example, or an injury, CGRP is released uh, within the meningeal vasculature to increase vasodilation. CGRP is also released from the trigeminal ganglion body itself, which excites surrounding glial cells, uh, satellite glial cells, which then release more inflammatory mediators. And CGRP is also released within the trigeminal nucleus caudalis itself, which leads to excitation of these second order neurons in the whole trigeminovascular system. And ultimately, you can kind of see how this is a positive feedback process that will lead to central hypersensitization and increased hyperalgesia and allodynia with repeated episodes of these processes. So this is why people with, uh, with migraines and with continued um, input from the sensory nervous system can sometimes become hypersensitive to pain signals or one of the processes that we think contributes to that. So the trigeminal nuclear complex then transmits these, uh, the activation to second order neurons within the posterior thalamus, uh, and other locations, and this further propagates central sensitization and leads to even further increased hyperalgesia and allodynia. There are several other sensory inputs into the trigeminal ganglion as well, uh, and these are then transmitted to the TNC and may participate in activating the trigeminovascular reflex as well. So you can see here, um, this is one that has to do with uh, innervation of the um, retinal pigmented epithelium in the eyes and may have something to do with the photosensitivity associated with migraine. So what is actually the trigger for migraines? Well, the best, uh, while this is slightly controversial, most neurologists believe that it's a wave of sustained depolarization that moves through intact uh, brain tissue called cortical spreading depression. Um, and this is triggered by oscillations in hypothalamic activity or by focal stimulation of the cerebral cortex from all kinds of insults. Those can be metabolic, they can be focal ischemia or other injurious stimuli. And in this case, for this patient, it could actually be a little bit of focal ischemia when she stands up and, for example, do, is performing the Nasaline test. So as brain cells lose energy as a result of these insults, cellular pumps uh, that utilize this energy start to force, uh, that usually force a, a concentration gradient in the cells, they start to lose their ability to do so. They fail to maintain their normal concentration gradient. So we get a redistribution of ions in the intracellular and extracellular environment with a large rise in extracellular potassium and in extracellular glutamate. And this actually initiates and propagates the neuronal and glial excitation and hyperactivity, which is followed by a res uh, response that's a prolonged suppression of neuronal activity and a reduction in extracellular space with local tissue edema. So in migraineurs, cortical brain cells actually begin to express upregulation of genes that are involved in these inflammatory process, uh, processes. 
and repeated inflammatory release of these molecules from the cortical cells during cortical spreading depression actually leads to increased permeability of the blood-brain barrier, which can result in a secondary release of other intracellular molecules and ions that sensitize to propagation of subcortical spreading depression, as well as sensitize the dural nociceptors of the trigeminal vascular system, uh, as we pointed out right at the edge of the skull there in, in the beginning. Cortical spreading depression is also associated with an increase in cerebral vasoconstrictive tone. So we get both an increase in pro-inflammatory substances and in vasoconstriction that is then sensed by these trigeminal sensory C-fiber nerve endings. So here we have some of the sensory C fibers, um, actually over here, I'm sorry, I have two screens, sensory C fibers that respond to these triggers and they actually release CGRP. So where you have CGRP receptors here on the uh, meningeal vasculature, you have them here on the trigeminal afferent uh, A-delta fibers and on dural mast cells and other satellite cells. CGRP activated dural mast cells actually create further inflammatory milieu, which activates nociceptor stimulation of both CGRP and really importantly, non-CGRP mediated pathways. So this is really the trigger for a, a rapid escalation in inflammatory pathways. And then ultimately you also have CR, uh, CGRP acting on the smooth muscle cells of the meningeal vasculature. And this actually incites intense compensatory and nitric, oxi nitric oxide driven cerebral vasoconstriction, which is what we've thought of traditionally as the problem in migraine, the vasoconstriction portion of this, the response. So CGRP and nitric oxide acting upon these trigeminal alpha delta fibers actually result in increased sensitization of those sensory fibers with downstream activation again of the TNC and of other secondary, uh, second order neurons. CGRP here is uh, diffusing to local satellite glial cells and astrocytes, which then release more nitric oxide and more inflammatory mediators in the local tissues that are affected. And the additional nitric oxide release of inflammatory mediators may act upon nearby neurons that don't have CGRP receptors. So obviously these neurons are sensitive to the nitric oxide, even if they're not uh, receptive to CGRP release. And this cascade ultimately promotes the release of other excitatory substances and other second order neuronal networks within the brain, uh, again, leading to long-term central sensitization. So just really briefly, CGRP antagonists are beginning to enter the, the field right now. Um, and they're thought to work in several different ways. One, they can bind the receptors on mast cells to block that inflammation. Uh, they uh, can inhibit the, uh, or they can block the binding um, to the vascular smooth muscle cells uh, and actually prevent the unwanted vasoconstriction that's associated with migraine symptoms. Um, and they combine the receptors on post-junctional cells to suppress uh, the enhancement of the trigeminal uh, vascular system in general. And in fact, they're even being looked at experimentally right now uh, as possible treatments um, for peripheral pain sensitization and even in, in symptoms like small fiber polyneuropathy. Uh, more to come on that hopefully in the next couple of years as studies continue. So this is just sort of a quick summary, but emerging evidence suggests that dysfunctional pain states such as osteoarthritis, visceral pain, hypersensitivity syndromes, fibromyalgia, IBS, neuropathic pain, headaches, including migraine, all may be caused as well by a deficient endogenous pain inhibitory system that allows for the development of these central sensitization pathways. So it's really pretty complex as you probably can appreciate. So moving on, our patient still has a few more problems. So she's had a lot of allergies. You remember she had a very extensive um, allergy list and uh, wanted to talk about the fact that now that it's spring, she had been spending some time outside in the backyard with her dog and her kids, and she was getting all these transient rashes on her arms, on her chest, neck, face, and back when she was in the sun. Her rashes, however, would only last for two to three hours and then resolve. They were very itchy. Uh, again, to go back to her ANA, it was one to 80, so that sometimes catches people's attention. Could this be lupus? There's photosensitive rashes, right? Um, she had no new meds or supplements that she could tie uh, to her rashes. She had tried using sunscreen, um, which seemed to make things worse. And she'd also tried staying in the shade the next time she went outside, but she was still getting these rashes. Um, she was also finding that, strangely enough, she was no longer able to eat asparagus. Every time she ate asparagus, she'd feel nauseated 
experienced chest palpitations and note a rash on the back of her left hand, actually on the dorsal portion of her hand. Her hands would become swollen and painful uh, as well when she start folding family laundry. Um, and she'd experience increasing runny nose, dyspnea, and wheezing when doing the laundry. So these things were all kind of cropping up over the last couple of weeks. She notes no history of hereditary angioedema. She has no personal or family history of anaphylaxis. She had not started any ACE inhibitors or ARBs recently. So this is actually um, some symptoms of what we suspect might be mast cell activation or inappropriate activation of mast cells. And, and it's probably a bit of a spectrum all the way up to something called uh, mast cell activation syndrome versus just inappropriate activation of mast cells. So this is essentially at its core an inappropriate or defective uh, activation of mast cells or their degranulation, which releases all of their inflammatory mediators. Um, and this is happening from abnormal triggering signals, not the ones we would usually expect uh, in allergies. So the syndrome itself is classified by very episodic symptoms that are consistent with mast cell mediator release and that affect at least two or more organ systems. And so as she had rhinorrhea and she had skin rashes and she had gastrointestinal issues with nausea when eating asparagus, these might've been some of the organ systems that were evolved in her case. Um, the episodes are essentially idiopathic and are not known to be completely caused by IgE antibody or other allergic triggers that are generally thought to activate mast cells. Uh, symptoms, if they are going to meet this definition, should decrease in frequency, uh, severity, or resolve with uh, anti-mediator therapies. In other words, if you treat with antihistamines, anti-leukotrienes, or other mast cell stabilization therapies, the symptoms should decrease. That's another way uh, to kind of confirm your suspicion of a mast cell activating syndrome if they actually respond to therapies. It's sort of a diagnostic and therapeutic test. So uh, hopefully this is uh, visible enough, but this is a collection of symptoms that you can actually experience with mast cell activation, which includes transient flushing of the face, neck, and chest, not unlike the vascular changes you see during that Nasaline test when there's orthostatic intolerance, itching and rash, uh, hives and, and, and urticaria, you can experience angioedema or focal angioedema, swelling of a part of the lip, for example, or a part of an eyelid, uh, nasal itching and congestion that can often look a lot like uh, seasonal allergic rhinitis, wheezing and shortness of breath that is often mistaken for asthma, um, throat itching, throat swelling, odynophagia, dysphagia, trouble swallowing, headaches, brain fog, interestingly enough, and even cognitive dysfunction, mood symptoms, anxiety and impression can be worsen transiently and actually be seen as emotional lability or what people like to call bipolar, but which we know is not consistent with the true definition of bipolar disorder. Um, gastrointestinal symptoms can be really underappreciated. Diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, bloating, dyspepsia are all found with mast cell activation. Uh, bone and muscle pain, uh, lightheadedness, syncope, fainting, tachycardia, palpitations, chest pain, low blood pressures, and even uterine cramps uh, and bleeding can be associated with abnormal activation of mast cells. Here we just have a list of some of the possible uh, effects of some of the mast cell mediators. So histamine leads to some of these flushing, uh, itching symptoms, diarrhea, hypotension, the leukotrienes released from the mast cells are particularly responsible for some of the pulmonary or upper respiratory symptoms. Prostaglandins can lead to a lot of the pain, the brain fog, and the, the cramping. Tryptase can lead to many of the skin lesions. Interleukins lead to some of the uh, fatigue, weight loss, and even sometimes lymphadenopathy. Uh, and, and even TNF is uh, tumor necrosis factor, factor from my old, uh, old job in rheumatology can lead to some of the fatigues, headaches, and body aches that we see when the mast cells are particularly activated. So here is just a quick list of some of the things that actually trigger these when we wouldn't expect a trigger for allergy otherwise. So heat, cold, and sudden temperature changes can actually activate, uh, be one of the abnormal signals that activate the mast cells. Stress, including emotional, physical stress, pain as a stress, or even environmental stressors. People uh, note that rapid weather changes or changes in barometric pressure, um, pollution, uh, such as inversion, can really trigger uh, symptoms. Exercise-induced, so when people have exercise-induced hives, think about mast cell activation. Uh, fatigue-induced mast cell uh, disruption, certain foods and beverages 
uh, alcohol, or in this person's case, asparagus, as weird as that may seem. Uh, NSAIDs are particularly known for triggering mast cells, but opioids, antibiotics, local anesthetics, contrast dyes from imaging studies can contribute. Um, natural odors, chemical odors, perfumes, and scents. I have a patient who comes into my office and starts to get hives when she smells my deodorant, which I didn't think was that smelly, um, but she can smell it across the room. She's that sensitive. Um, venoms from uh, mosquitoes and insects, fleas, snakes. Uh, I don't recommend being bit by snakes, but those can, can trigger symptoms. Even infections, uh, viral, bacterial, fungal infections, uh, the common cold, you know, somebody catches something from their kid that gets much, much more sick. Uh, think about this. Mechanical irritation, repeated rubbing uh, or friction or vibration can contribute to it, and even sun or sunlight. So not all photosensitive rashes are autoimmune, especially if they're more transient and come and go within two or three hours. And then I think it bears a witness, as goofy as this uh, image is here, to talk about uh, coexisting conditions among mast cell uh, activation as well. So people often experience interstitial cystitis. They often experience eosinophilic esophagitis, fibromyalgia, uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, multiple chemical sensitivities, like the person who can't stand my, my BO or my uh, lack thereof with my deodorant, uh, dysautonomia, restless leg syndrome, uh, MECFS or chronic fatigue syndrome, multiple sclerosis, among many others. So this is tied in and a while it's its own diagnosis in some ways, is actually a part of these, uh, or a component of these chronic illnesses. So going back to our patient now, um, she always comes with a new challenge for us. Um, and she's saying, you know what, I'm noticing a lot of sprained joints and increasing joint pain. So she had tried to uh, start implementing a mild exercise and core strengthening program and began doing some yoga and was noticing as she's doing these more, more what she would call joint sprains uh, were becoming frequent. And the yoga seemed to be exacerbating specific joint pain, including in her elbows, her knees, and her wrists. She would notice this pain with movement and with use, but it was improved with rest when she wouldn't use the joints. She didn't notice any clear swelling of the joints, any redness um, or heat over the joints. And she had no response of her symptoms to acetaminophen or Tylenol, and would only notice mild improvement with oral NSAIDs. Uh, however, she couldn't tolerate these uh, for very long because it was called, would cause dyspepsia. Um, she's always noted that she's been a little more flexible than other people and could do some, some party tricks, actually. Um, and she actually remembers a lot of joint sprains and joint pains when she was back in gymnastics in grade school. And she said, you know, that's actually why she kind of fell out of gymnastics, because it was becoming so painful and she was always having joint issues and injuries. So this is actually an example of hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is not really one of the EDS symptoms that I remember being taught in medical school, residency, or even truly rheumatology fellowship. Um, it is actually the most common, however, subtype of EDS, and it's thought to be the most common actually of all hereditary disorders of connective tissue disease. Um, this is a, a term that has come to replace the previous classifications for EDS type three, uh, EDS hypermobile type, and then what they call joint hypermobility syndrome. Its prevalence is estimated to be as high as one in 5,000 people, 80 to 90 percent of which, um, that's, that's for EDS in total, but 80 to 90 percent of which is hypermobile type EDS. So that's about 10 million people in the U.S. alone. Uh, and unlike classic or vascular EDS, there is no single gene mutation causing this syndrome that's been identified. In fact, it might be a collection or a spectrum disorder of symptoms. Um, it has multiple genetic influences, and it's th though it is thought to be in general, or at least uh, in summary, an autosomal dominant disorder with incomplete penetrance um, that is influenced by environmental factors, including age, including gender, um, and with a predilection for females, but not absence in males. Um, so one of the easiest ways to look for this in clinic, and you can kind of appreciate all this hypermobility on these pictures here to the right, is to perform something called a Baten score for hypermobility. And I remember being really intimidated uh, by this testing in the past, thinking it would take forever. Who has time for this? But I wanted to show in this video here just how simple this actually can be and how quickly you can do it. So there's five main tests. Um, four of which are bilateral, and I'm going to run through it on this really quick video here, and you can also see examples of the tests on the bottom. 
So here, she's pulling her thumbs all the way back to her arm. And you would do that bilaterally, you get a score for that. This is the finger or the pinkies that can be pulled back. The elbows are hyperextensible, again, bilateral testing. The knees can uh, be flexed backwards, and then she has no trouble touching her palms uh, down to the floor. So that's a, that's a pan-positive test right there. Hmm. Oops, didn't mean to open that. This is a tomato. Apologize for that. Let's see where my PowerPoint went. Here we go. I think we're back on track there. So this is the criteria for diagnosis of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And I'm not necessarily uh, suggesting that we all try to do the complete diagnosis uh, in clinic, but to, to be attentive, to pay attention and be aware of hypermobility in our clinic. So what's interesting is that the, the uh, Baten score is just the first criterion, right? We're looking for hypermobility. Um, in men and women less than age 50, they're more likely to be hypermobile than those who are older, whose joints have stiffened up, whose muscles have stiffened up over time. So a score of five or greater and under 50 would be considered a positive Baten score, whereas a score of greater than four um, in those over, greater than or equal to four in those over uh, age 50 would be positive. So the second criteria is a little more complicated. You're looking for some of the skin changes, hyperextensibility, easy bruising, soft velvety skin, um, certain kinds of papules, history of abdominal hernias as a, as a sign of weakness of the, of the skin tissue, pelvic floor weakness, uterine prolapse, especially if it's particularly um, not seeming to be uh, incited by the normal things we would expect it to be incited by. Uh, arm span to height ratio, or what they call the APE index at my local climbing gym, and uh, aortic root dilation or mitral valve prolapse. Uh, positive family history uh, is another criteria here, and then you must have at least one of musculoskeletal pain in two or more limbs, like our patient has. Chronic widespread pain for greater than three months, very common, um, and recurrent uh, joint dislocations or just joint instability in the absence of trauma. So I wanted to point that out and show the overlap here in our patient population with fatigue and with pain. Hypermobility is associated actually again with a lot of other comorbid symptoms, including functional gastrointestinal disorders, which include dyspepsia and irritable bowel syndrome. It's often associated with dysautonomia syndromes, including POTS. Uh, lots of pelvic and bladder dysfunction, lots of anxiety disorders and depression, um, that may be a little more than just central nervous system mediated, but may have some roots in the dysautonomia that is also driving the POTS, uh, fatigue and sleep disturbances, poor quality of life, mast cell activation disorder is highly associated with EDS, and then it can, of course, be associated with other more traditional inflammatory rheumatology diseases, osteoarthritis, headache, um, headache syndromes, including TMJ dysfunction, uh, muscle spasms in the neck, neck instability, and, and pain are all found in EDS, and even osteoporosis is increased in those with, with uh, hypermobile EDS. And um, our patient is now back to us in clinic once again with more questions. I think this is her last question of the day. Um, so she had been participating in a physical therapy uh, program um, and was starting to notice increasing neck pain and fatigue. So this therapy program was actually designed for her because of her EDS. Um, and she was trying to support her joints um, and improve her, uh, her pain and also her joint stability around these hypermobile joints. But three weeks ago when she was performing one of her neck stretching exercises, she, she heard and felt a pop. Um, and while it wasn't exactly painful, she immediately felt nauseated. She felt really dizzy. Her vision seemed impaired. Um, and she had this kind of suboccipital pressure right at the base of her skull that was unlike any other kind of pain that she had experienced. Um, but there wasn't a traditional neck pain with this event. Uh, she had no motor weakness, she had no radiating paresthesias, no shooting pains down her arms to suggest any radiculopathy. She uh, had an additional upper extremity EMG NCS that was performed by one of her PM&R physicians. And this was actually unremarkable, except for some mild right-sided carpal tunnel syndrome. And who, of course, doesn't have that with our computer-based society these days? Symptoms would wax and wane then over the course of the day uh, and days following this episode, with some days worse than others and some times of the day worse than others. But she couldn't identify any clear pattern 
to why these symptoms would flare up and get better. She uh, went to a chiropractor because it was easier to get into than her local doctor and would feel almost back to normal after some uh, manipulation and treatments that involved the neck specifically. So this is actually an introduction to the concept of craniocervical instability or craniocervical cervical junction abnormalities. Um, and what these are essentially is these are acquired abnormalities of the occipital bone of the foramen magnum or of the first two cervical vertebrae that ultimately lead to an anatomical decrease in space for the structures that exist in there, including the cerebellum, potentially the lower brainstem, the cervical spinal cord. Um, and then there's this associated chronic pathological deformation or pressure put on these structures. This is more likely to occur as an acquired injury in those with these inherited connective tissue diseases. Certainly some people are born with this congenitally, but we tend to see it in the adult population uh, as an acquired injury. There's an estimated prevalence uh, that one in 15 people with hypermobile EDS actually go on to develop some degree of craniocervical instability from really, really mild and subtle to very severe. Um, and that's supposed to say may, not my, uh, occur as the result of a head or neck injury or trauma, such as a whiplash injury in a motor vehicle accident or snowmobile accident like a patient I had recently, or, or even through repetitive stretching injuries. Um, and sometimes even something as simple as rotating one's head to look over their shoulder, perhaps when driving and make a lane change, that's even been associated with uh, this type of injury. So it leads to a collection of nerve dysfunction or even nerve cell death from repetitive stretching or deformative stress of these structures that, involve, that are involved in this anatomical area. Um, one of the things that can happen is retroflexion of the odontoid process that, remember, extends up um, through the frame and magnum. Uh, and this can be the result of misalignment in the setting of very loose ligaments, uh, perhaps in HEDS. Uh, which allows the od odontoid process to actually compress the brainstem. You can actually then get a thickened odontoid capsulation or panis formation, like we traditionally would think of in rheumatoid arthritis, where the joints um, are hypermobile and then the panis can grow large enough to actually erode into the articular cartilage and bone and allow the odontoid itself to compress the brainstem. Um, and then people can also experience Chiari malformation, where they have downward herniation of the cerebellar tonsils, with resulting pressure developing on the cerebellum and on the brainstem. And sometimes when this is severe, this can even impede CSF flow. So um, when these stretch injuries are particularly severe, we can actually get basilar invagination, which is actually where the odontoid process can project above the frame and magnum, as you can see right here, um, and uh, move into the bottom of the cell, um, sorry, of the skull. And this is a pretty severe manifestation of this injury. Symptoms that people will describe with this are actually quite variable, like most things with the nervous system. Uh, one thing that's common, however, is a pressure headache. Um, we often think this is uh, a result of impaired CSF flow uh, that increases the intracranial pressure and then is exacerbated by valsalva maneuvers, including when people yawn, when they laugh, cry, cough, sneeze, or even when they strain, such as having a bowel movement. There's also a sensation of what's called heavy headache. And this is where people describe that their, their head feels too heavy on their shoulders, like they can't hold it up. And almost like they're a bobblehead from a sporting event. Um, dysautonomia is highly, highly uh, common in this type of injury, where the brainstem compression leads to dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system, such as symptoms of tachycardia, of heat and cold intolerance, of orthostatic intolerance, again, moving back to our Nasaline test, syncope, delayed gastric emptying, excessive and chronic fatigue, and even things like polydipsia or extreme thirst. And I would remind you, going back to that trigeminal vascular reflex and the trigeminal nucleus caudalis, that there are inputs at the C1, C2 level, which you can imagine could be impinged upon by uh, an injury like this. Other symptoms include the association with sleep apnea or increasing sleep apnea after an injury such as this, neck pain, difficulties with balance, facial pain or numbness, muscle weakness, vertigo is very common. In addition to syncopal dizziness, the actual spinning of the room uh, is a separate and independent symptom. Tinnitus, hearing loss, trouble swallowing, reduced gag reflex, uh, visual problems, and in particular downward nystagmus, 
can be found if you look carefully for it. Nausea and emesis and even impaired coordination can all be found with craniocervical instability. Now diagnosing it is an enormous challenge. So the goal here today is not to catch every case, but to be aware of it, right? So in the office setting, uh, I, would, I would argue that considering to consider performing upright cervical traction without twisting or rotation, of course, to see if patient's symptoms improve or resolve. There are some people with a more severe injury where you literally lift on the neck and you can actually resolve some of their symptoms. Alternatively, uh, there's this test that I remember called the axial load test. And this was from residency and uh, from a really crusty old physician where he would say, you know the patient has fibromyalgia if you push on their head and that one hurts because there's no anatomical reason for that. Well, it turns out there actually might be because in this case, downward pressure applied to the skull actually worsens symptoms, right? You're compressing that area that, that is the anatomical issue in the first place. Um, there is a bit of uh, invasive cervical traction that's starting to make it into the literature and into medical practice. Uh, it's not widely available, of course, but this is an inpatient procedure wherein a patient's head is um, pulled uh, from their body by an upward pulley system. Um, so there, that might be something that becomes more widely available in the next few years as we learn more about this condition. But right now, our best gold standard, and, and I say for right now because we're still updating this literature all the time, is, is the combination, unfortunately, of an upright MRI and a rotational CT scan. Not the easiest things to get. So imaging in the upright position is of critical importance if we're actually trying to detect, uh, detect these injuries. So supine lying healthy individual, individuals um, have MRIs in the setting of HEDS where they, like in this particular picture, where you actually don't see the uh, pathology. The cerebellum here is contained within the skull as would be expected. Uh, and the angle of the odontoid bone is right, right here within normal limits, and you can see the cerebellum is up in the skull. But when you put them into a sitting position, when they're now upright, when gravity is playing a role, perhaps they have less blood flow in their brain as part of the orthostatic intolerance they're already experiencing. Now you can see that the cerebellar tonsils are actually herniating downward, uh, and there's dis a displaced odontoid bone that is actually retroflexed, which is putting pressure now uh, right here on the brainstem. Um, so in this particular example, the patient's connective tissue was too weak to hold the cerebellum upward, and it was this upright positioning that would lead to this transient uh, worsening of symptoms. So uh, that is a lot to go over in one patient, of course, uh, and there are a lot of associated symptoms with each one of these conditions. So this can feel completely overwhelming, and uh, I don't blame any of you for wanting to jump out the window, inject yourself with the medications. <laughs> or uh, to just say, hey, as long as I'm not making you worse, I'm doing the best I can. But I do want to just point out that when we look at this population of patients with chronic pain and fatigue, these causes are multifactorial. This is not an independent diagnosis of its own. And when we look deeper, we find all kinds of interesting things, um, all kinds of different causes, all kinds of different symptoms and symptoms that overlap making the lines of official diagnosis extremely blurry. You know, what came first? Did they start out with, with POTS and then develop anxiety? Or did they start out with EDS and then develop POTS and chronic fatigue? Did a concussion make them more likely to develop migraines and fibromyalgia and functional GI disorders? And I think this is the, um, the challenge and the frustration with taking care of this patient population, but it's also the joy of taking care of this patient population. It's extremely uh, rewarding to unravel these mysteries and to really start addressing things symptom by symptom to improve patients' quality of life. You don't have to have all the answers to sit down and say, I understand that what you're experiencing is extremely disabling and uh, debilitating, and I'm here to support you through that, and I will do my best to walk you through this process. It's what I've done since joining the Bateman Horn Center, and I would encourage people that even when you're entering a phase where you don't exactly know what's going on, uh, just trying to listen to the patient, believe them, understand that this is not them being um, reactionary or, or uh, just extremely uh, emotional about things, that they have a lot going on. And we just don't always have the tools to completely understand that yet. So that is all I have for today. And I would love to hear your questions if you have any, and hopefully I can answer some of them. But 
medicine's still working on these questions too. As you're preparing your questions, I wonder if, if Dr. Bateman or Dr. Yeldman, can one of you give us a quick preview on what we're looking for to do tomorrow? I, I'd be happy to. So tomorrow we're going to try to um, unite some of this discussion um, by, by having sort of a practical clinical approach um, to identifying um, as much as you can in patients with these disorders um, using some already established um, evidence-based diagnostic criteria. Um, and um, we're going to talk about pain amplification syndromes. We're going to talk about <coughs> more, a little bit more about uh, evaluating orthostatic intolerance and, and where to go from that. And we're going to also talk about um, the diagnostic criteria for myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, that's often called MECFS. We're going to introduce those and talk about how they can be a useful, very useful clinical tool for organizing um, and, and approaching um, patients with these complicated overlapping disorders.